Okay, power mail, please. Where are we off to? We're off to the RAC club, which is, uh, power mail is full of what used to be called gentlemen's clubs. Yes. Um, Nigel Farage is touring the business clubs of ago, London. Women this is my club here, you, having the work done. The East India Club. East India Club. Yeah. And that was Drumming up cash on the back of his recent political successes for his UK independence party, UKIP. I've got billionaires. I mean, you know, to them, a hundred grand's like you're not going for a pint, you know. But 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 there's, there's, there's still quite a lot of people actively engaged in business who fear if they're seen to support UKIP, somehow the establishment won't, uh, won't approve. Well, well, well or, or there could or that you know there could be recriminations against them. It's, for years, he's been branded as a racist. It wasn't quite polite to say you were a supporter. But his strong anti-immigration message has made him this year's rising star of UK politics. Is that still the case? Um, I think it's changed. I think the class dimension comes back into this, actually. I think in sort of upper middle class dinner parties, um, you know, if you said you were UKIP, you probably wouldn't get invited back. Um, but I think amongst the mass of the population, um, it seemed to be a perfectly reasonable, decent, respectable thing for us to say. I mean, having said that, having said that, you know, we've got two Dukes who are now members of UKIP, and, 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 and it, it needs people with courage. And so often what I get, I get it from serving members of parliament from both the Conservative and Labour parties who say, well, Nigel, you know, good on you, old son. I mean, keep going, you know. I say, well, thank you very much. And what are you going to do to help me? Oh, no, 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 no. If, if I was to say anything, I might lose my seat or they might deselect me. So it is almost, I mean, we're almost back to Oscar Wilde, you know, that this is the politics that dare not speak its name. <laughs> Which, of course, makes it even more fun, in yeah. my view. Farage's support base is not in large urban centres like London. Chuck, chuck, chucks! It's largely in country and regional areas like here in Ledbury, West Midlands. Jim Carver is a third generation umbrella maker and part of the UKIP phenomena which is sweeping Britain. I've been doing umbrellas since what, 1991, full time. I mean, obviously as a youngster growing up, sort of watching my, watching my father and sort of helping dad as a youngster, but full time since 1991. I do bespoke stuff, I do a few antique repairs um, when time permits and I make bookmakers umbrellas for, for the on-course bookmakers, so it's a bit of a niche market. Yeah. Carver's niche market has taken a hit from cheap imports in recent years. But Jim has just launched a new career. He's just been elected as one of Britain's representatives to the European Parliament. It is, it's... Um, on one of UKIP's key Britain, platforms you know, to pull Britain out European of the EU. I've made up my mind about um, how I feel about Britain's future relationship with the European Union. Very straightforward, I believe we're better off out. And yeah. that's what sets us apart from you know, the other established political parties. You know, Nigel often says you can't get a cigarette paper between the three main parties. Well, in fact, you know, that doesn't apply to us because we're... we're very, different. We're very clear. Hi. Yeah, we start, start over here. For the past 12 months, UKIP, to the growing consternation of both Labor and the Conservatives, Good morning. has been picking off a range of small elections across the country. Fundamentally, I'm pro-European. OK. Um, At least you've got an opinion. Like this council election in Malvern Hills, which Jim is door-knocking for. If we want to leave the European Court of Human Rights or Convention of Human Rights, we have to withdraw from the European Union. The people in this countryside electorate seem highly receptive to a candidate talking about the esoterica of European politics. How can we compete with other countries in Europe if they're controlling our power base, our water base? The British electorate have always been receptive to what we've to our message um, you know, about Britain's relationship with the European Union and where it's heading. But what, but I, what's I, your shorthand message? You get, sometimes think, you get 20 seconds with uh, okay. when you're door knocking. What, what, what's the trigger? The, 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 for sure, our message is, is I know clearly what we stand for, and the issue of immigration um, is a huge issue. How do you feel about UKIP? How do you feel about the European Union? European trade intricacies may be lost on some voters in a local council election, but one UKIP issue always shines through. And it's, I'm not being xenophobic or anything like that. Is there's immigration? It's about We're just a little job. tiny country. Yeah, it's about having control. opposition to the large number of migrants that have arrived in Britain through its membership of the EU has led UKIP to victory in local elections like this. If I was a racist, I wouldn't be in a party like UKIP. I'd be on an extreme party. Yeah. 
and resoundingly so for the British seats in the EU Parliament earlier this year. 526,000 people settled in this country last year. Beating both Labour and the Conservatives. <laughs> the first party in over a century to do that in a UK-wide election. Say it how it is. I will, don't worry. A considerable personal triumph for Nigel Farage. <laughs> I tell you what, I've been up half the night, this is absolutely marvellous. <laughs> for more than a decade, Farage has been seen as little more than a fringe opponent of Britain's membership of the EU. Now he's being mooted as the third force in British politics, priming himself for next year's general election. Part of my life is that we actually have to fund this party. We get no state money yeah. or support at all. Yeah, someone's got to pay for it all. Um, well, the irony is at the moment, though, the people that are paying for it is the EU. Well, <laughs> the, well, <laughs> well the EU has certainly been very helpful. I mean, it's a, it must be a major boost, though. I mean, there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of salaries that you're able to pull out of that now. We are, yes, but... Which is ironic, uh, nothing. Oh, deliciously no. ironic, yeah. <laughs> um, almost every single day I'm in London, I'm out at lunch or dinner and, and trying to raise cash. OK, I'll see you later. later. Cheers. As Farage rattles his tins amongst the billionaires, just around the corner, others are begging for their lunch. Romanian migrants living rough on London's finest boulevards. Police problem, go, go. Police, go, go. Morning. In such numbers that the council employs staff to harass and move them on. Can I get your bulletins, please, for our records? I, I know you, don't I, from before? That's me. Where's the minister? Yes. Since Romania and Bulgaria joined the EU, their citizens have had full rights of movement across Europe and Britain. Why did you come here? Why here? And their presence in such large numbers has propelled UKIP's anti-EU message onto the centre stage. We're not saying the Romanians are all beastly people or anything like that. What we are saying is that as a result of uncontrolled open-door immigration, four million people now have settled in Britain over the last 14 years. You know, if you go and visit Romania, you go and visit Bulgaria, you'd be shocked. You would be deeply, deeply shocked to see the living conditions of millions of people who come from the Roma community. They were actually better off under communism. The war comes down, uh, big capital, big business, the organised criminal gangs take over much of the economy of those countries and these people are now completely excluded. I mean, what would you do if you're an 18-year-old living in Bucharest? I'd go to London. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. Strasbourg, northern France. It's the first week of sitting at the European Parliament for its new members. I'll be back here after okay. Right. Farage knows these corridors of power well. Let's go do it. Rather nice offices you've got. Uh... Oh, well, it's all paid for by the taxpayer. Money's no object. <laughs> He's been a member here since 1999. Well, we've got these offices here. They're duplicated in Brussels. And the administration centre's all in Luxembourg. A parliament with three homes. Ah. Don't think of this as a parliament. Think of it as a temple. And the people that come here from left and right have over the decades been true believers, true believers in the creation of a European dream. So that one actually there's going to be a meeting where he's going to knock you. So it's almost heresy yeah. for someone like me to come here and, and, and irony of ironies, take a front seat position in the parliament. I mean, it's absolutely hilarious. Oh, how exciting. Good morning, everybody. It's the first party meeting for the new UKIP members before parliament sits. It's uh, a big, big change from the last Parliament where voting meetings took place in my office because we could quite easily cram them all in uh, there. Um, 24 members from regions across the breadth of Britain and almost all of them are political novices. So, it's Ray's first meeting in the chair as Deputy Whip. Since he was first elected to the EU in 99, Farage has been President. Britain's principal Eurosceptic. The United Kingdom in relation to the BSE crisis. His view that the institution was a threat to British independence was seen as an eccentric one. However, such a view would be wrong. 
but his message became relevant to many when Eurozone migration began to impact over the past decade. We are now signed up to a system where 485 million people have the right to come and live and work and settle in Britain. Nearly half a billion people could just come in. Mm. Uh, we have no control over quantity. We have no control over quality. We can't even deport criminals. So, so we vote for that? No, we vote against that one. If you don't like others here today, the umbrella man, Jim Carver, is still learning the ropes on how the parliament operates. And I don't know if, if the colleagues are aware that... A procedural vote, vote was held in the morning and he hit the wrong button to vote. When I voted this morning, if you do vote and make a, make a mistake, you can go through the European Parliament website and change your vote just to ensure that you have 24 hours. Can you, can you just talk us through that, Jim? Well, yeah, <laughs> you can make your life the worst no. than that. You try to get me to do it. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I've got nature, I've got nature, make on my yeah. is, is that all? Yeah. Wonderful, thank you very much. Well done. Good. So this is, uh, this is really the first real business, this is a... a yes it is, and we've had our little voting meeting and uh, it was all rather entertaining and a lot of new boys who weren't really quite sure what they were doing or where they were going, but that's alright, we can live with that. That's part of the, uh, the team, is it? Well, it's, it's, it's just like going to school, isn't it? You know, you go up to big school when you're 11 and you feel like completely out of your depth, but I'm just going home my money. After a not-so-discreet back turn to the European anthem, it's down to business. The election of parliamentary president Jean-Claude Juncker. And Farage is off. Well, thank you and good morning, everybody. Uh, if this is European democracy in action, as we've heard this morning, I suggest we have a rethink. We've all got to be asked to vote, and we've got one candidate to vote for. I mean, it's like good old Soviet times, isn't it? Surely democracy means you get rather more of a choice than one. They're going to know we're here. Oh. <laughs> Don't you worry about that. No, we're going to be vocal, we're going to be vociferous, and also, I couldn't do something unless it was fun. <laughs> so what of our nominee? Well, on the plus side, Mr Juncker, you are a sociable cove uh, with a very much better sense of humour than most people I've met in Brussels. Uh, but we are being asked to vote for the ultimate Brussels insider, somebody who was always operated with dark backroom deals and stitch-ups, and I have to say that our group overwhelmingly will vote no. We don't want business as usual because the vast majority of European people don't want a European state and don't want that anthem. The EU Parliament is now an unusual mix, providing home and succour to many who want to disband it. It's been the principal platform for decades for Holocaust denier Jean-Marie Le Pen and his French National Front. As it is now for his daughter Marine Le Pen, who, like UKIP, enjoyed the top billing in her nation's recent EU vote. Yes, uh, whether you like it or not, dear fellow countrymen, they chose to send a very clear message. No, no to massive immigration, no to the dilution of our national identities, and yes to our nations. It's an easy scapegoat in financial difficult times. Catherine Bearder, UK representative of the Liberal Democrats, you talk to any employer, believes that parties like the National Front and UKIP will fade away as the European economy improves. So it's very easy to say times are difficult here, it's their fault. Right. Uh, and, and point the finger at migrants and it's the fault of the European Union, it's the fault of, of them over there, they're trying to get you. Do you think people have an objection to the EU in itself or is it an objection to EU migrants? Which trigger has really Up worked for you? Up to now, the, the, the reason for UKIP is to take the UK out of the European Union. Now there is a, a political argument you can have about that. This campaign he has really moved into 
the Romanians. They're, they're criminals. They're coming here to take your jobs. It's an old and very easy political trick. Okay, so... But Conservative Party member David Campbell Bannerman, formerly an ally of Farage's, sees no sign of the opposition to EU migration easing. He's been part of the push within the Conservative Party to embrace it. Immigration is now the number one issue in Britain, uh, the, uh, an independent poll showing the Mori Issues Index, uh, is even bigger than the economy at the moment for the first time since 2008. So it is a huge issue and certainly in the politics of it favour UKIP. Uh, but I think the issue of UKIP is whether they're a real political party or just a protest party. Um, I think they've made a massive impact, but actually uh, other parties have now moved, particularly the Conservative Party, we're offering a referendum, the chance to the, for the British people to vote to leave the EU, which is the central it plan seems that way. Is that, That's a reaction to UKIP's success? I mean, but for now, the anti-migration votes are all there for Farage's taking. In London, one of Farage's lunches has ended badly when he was asked to stop smoking. Uh, you're a terrible bunch of wankers. <laughs> it was amazing. We had lunch. We sat outside on the terrace and they wouldn't let me smoke. I said, what's the matter? Isn't the ceiling high enough? You know, it was absolutely unbelievable. We are being controlled by Puritans who want us to live forever so that we can preserve ourselves for those last few bonus years. Yeah. We're not saying smoking's good, we're not doing that. It's a symbol of getting the state off our back. Big government. I can't stand it. <laughs> and uh, that, that's resonating a bit. I mean, not smoking in itself, but that sort of sentiment is... Uh... I think that's right. I think, you know, speed cameras and... You know, we've we just had a three-week um, sort of, not heat wave, but really quite good weather for three weeks. There, there are government warnings. You know, wear a hat. Um, Put, put, I don't know, factor 75 all over your body. Um, drink water. I mean, you think we never had a, had, had a summer before in this country? Oh, I just, why don't they all just butt out? <laughs> so I think about it. I think we all feel a bit like that, yeah. Farage has tapped into a range of ideas that have been broadly off limits in political debate. What is our vision? Utterly confounding the established parties. And within the ruling Conservative Party, cracks are starting to appear. I'm today leaving the Conservative Party and joining UKIP. Just over a fortnight ago, the Conservative MP for Clacton, Douglas Carswell, defected from the Tories and joined UKIP. The bravest, most honourable and noblest thing I've seen in British politics in my lifetime. But there were more storms to come. The Conservatives fight back after losing another MP to UKIP, the second within a month. The On the weekend, a second Tory MP jumped ship. Today, I am leaving the Conservative Party. And... Of course, the question mark tonight is, are there other potential defectors in the pipeline? The Tories are hurting this week, but with a general election due early next year, Farage has his eye firmly on ripping through the middle of both established parties. The politics in this country today is purely run by a bunch of uh, rich college kids. His conversation is often scattered with attacks on the rich and the privileged of Britain, uh, a clear call to Labour voters. A, you're seen as a right-wing um, party. Can you go against the interests of capital, which is what you've just suggested, really? Um, I, you know, this thought that we're right-wing in any conventional sense, just couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I think the extent to which the land-owning, capital-owning classes of this country um, have benefited themselves over the course of the last few years, between the 5 or 6% that have everything and the rest that have nothing, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. The sudden rise of UKIP is creating a mild panic amongst both Labour and the Conservatives. Farage seems determined to continue scooping votes from left, right and centre. Possibly a difficult balancing act to maintain all the way to the May election next year. The goal's clear. You know, we want to hold the balance of power in the next parliament. And people say to me, oh, Nigel, that is just outrageously ambitious. Well, do you know what? Yes. Why not? When I said to people three years ago, we could win the European elections, they all laughed at me. Well, 
Farage doesn't need to deliver his own punchline. No one is laughing now.